So, um, welcome back to number six. I think it's number six, it's April, number six. April 2022, and uh, we're at it again. And I just heard from the kitchen, they're making food. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, Todd's got the wines lined up. He's got the tasty notes already. And uh, we've got the music playlist uh, all dialed in. I, I think I wrapped it up a little bit this morning, but I'm sure I'll add a couple hundred more songs by the time you get it. So, um, so there we have it. As uh, as always, I will I will leave this to uh, to Todd to 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 go and uh, do his thing, and and I will chirp in and uh, hopefully break his train of thought and see how he reacts. So let's go. All right. Well, welcome. Uh, we're going to start with wine number one, which is from Greece. Uh, the True Peace Winery, their, their Tomi uh, range of wines. Uh, this is from the Mantinea uh, PDO, which is uh, in the Peloponnese region of Greece. And the name of the, the grape variety is called Mosho Filero. It is a white grape that um, has pink skin, so not dissimilar to like Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio in that sense. So the grape is usually made, to, made into white or rosé wines. Um, if you've had a chance to try it, it's incredibly aromatic. It's a very perfumed grape variety. Um, reminds me a lot of, say, Gewürztraminer or Muscat, but with those particular grapes, those aromatic grapes, the, um, the acidity tends to be quite low, and that is not the case with this wine. There's a beautiful freshness to it. Um, what else can I tell you? It is a winery that uh, is fairly new, this uh, the True Peace Winery. Uh, the family has been making wine since the 1970s. They've had uh, vines on their property. And in the 70s, they started out by making wines for like personal consumption, for family consumption. And then whatever grapes they didn't use uh, for that, then they would sell off to their neighbors and other wineries. Um, in 2010, they decided they were going to make a go of it as a winery. Uh, so they started investing in their vineyards a little bit more and they, they built a new winery. They've got a beautiful, modern facility where they focus on native Greek uh, grape varieties, most of which I cannot pronounce. Um, but yeah, they make clean, uh, fresh uh, whites and reds. Um, yeah, they got about seven hectares of vineyards. Uh, not a huge winery, but certainly interesting. Uh, great uh, value can be found in Greece because you know, a lot of people don't know what the wines are. They're hard to pronounce. Um, you know, you're not going to see generally, you're not going to see like Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, what have you. Um, but it's always good to try new wines from new places. So um, when I tried this a few months ago. I thought this is really unique and it stands out. Uh, and I thought it would be great for spring. So that's why we have it uh, in this month's wine box. So I'll give you a little quick tasting note here. As I mentioned, this wine is incredibly perfume so super aromatic on the nose uh, I get a lot of ripe fruit it reminds me of uh, white peach and then there's almost like a confected uh, citrus like lemon lime candy um, bergamot white pepper it's got a lovely mineral character as well and then of course lots of flowers I get jasmine uh, the palate is dry beautiful round texture in the mouth, you know, moderate amount of freshness, uh, you know, moderate, moderate plus alcohol. There's a little bit of weight to this wine, but it's still fresh, has some good minerality. Um, and the finish, uh, you know, finishes uh, fruity and very pleasant. So I think this is a really cool spring wine. Anybody that's having a picnic or a barbecue, uh, the traditional pairings for this are, are seafood. Uh, you know, I think this would be really good with like calamari with tzatziki and, uh, and lemon. You know, they eat a lot of that in Greece. Uh, yesterday when I was trying this wine, I was also about to have my dinner. So I tried this with a, a turkey noodle soup and it worked just fine with the turkey. But I found it really played well off of the vegetables like the carrots, the onions, the uh, celery that were in the soup. So I actually think this would work really well with like a vegetarian soup like minestrone or, you know, some kind of spring vegetable soup, maybe with asparagus. I think that would be quite good as well. But the traditional, the traditional uh, pairing would be seafood for sure. Are you going to find this grape anywhere outside of Greece? Uh, I have never seen it anywhere outside of Greece. That's not to say that it doesn't exist, but uh, I personally have 
on my travels and in my studies have never seen this grape outside of Greece. And how many times, like, does this fall into the category of, um, now I suspect, you know, you deal with a lot of wines, not from this area, not from Greece in general. Yes. Um, uh, how often times do you, do you have a wine where someone brings it in because you're constantly being presented with wines to get on our list and uh, you're like, well, this is probably going to be a waste of my time. And then you're pleasantly surprised, you know, and would this fall in that category? Because I, I, we've never had a Greek wine, I, I don't think. No, I mean, not, not since I've been there. And, you know, it, that's why I taste everything because you just, you never know, right? Um, you know, there's always, the, there's great wines being made all over the world. And just because I don't under, I don't know it or understand it doesn't mean that it can't be good. And, you know, this isn't a terribly expensive wine. I think at retail, this would have around the $30 mark, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly not super inexpensive, but it's not crazy expensive either. I mean, you can drink this on a Tuesday night, no problem. And, and not feel like you're breaking the bank. So yeah, I think it's really cool. And I think it's something that uh, I will buy again to have with like some fresh seafood over the summer, you know, maybe mussels and clams. And we've got a few extra bottles. So this will make its way onto the feature board uh, at Oddfish eventually in the spring and the summer. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to work great with our fresh food. You know, when I also think of Greece, um, I think of hot, mm. hot, hot. Is there, are there just a few regions in Greece where you can grow grapes where it's not too hot or, um, uh, or, or are there certain places that, that, you know, these three or four islands is where the, the grapes are going to grow or, or is it all over the place? Uh, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit, I do not know a lot about uh, Greek uh, viticulture, um, but it, it's from what I can tell, it's grow, grapes are grown all over the, the country um, on the different islands. This, this is actually from, Kind of like mainland Greece, it's not on one of the islands. It's mm -hmm. on that peninsula that juts out. Um, but yeah, I mean they they grow. There's there's viticulture all over Greece. Right? I mean, yeah. it, it started with them, right? So yeah. yeah, they've got grapes planted everywhere. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I like it. It's uh, it definitely is uh, summertime summertime odd fish wine. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like ice cold uh, on the patio, or you know, yeah. with hot weather, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. All so, right. Even better than just Tuesday night chicken soup. We could do we could do any night at Odd Fish with this. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Okay, so wine number two is a rosé from Provence. The winery is Domaine de Valdichon, and the label is Valion des Anges or the Valley of the Angels. Hey, uh, hey, sorry, sorry, Todd. To one, um, go back just a second. These colors are incredibly like if you did not label my wines, I would have been confused which one was my my Greek wine, which one's my rose. That's for sure. Yeah, and is it because you got a lot more color because the pink grapes on the uh, on the first wine, or is it just be, or is it because this one's so light or a bit of both? Oh, it's it's because uh, okay. wine number one, the the, the Tome, the True Peace Winery, Mosho Falero, Like I mentioned, it, it has pink skins like Pinot Gris. So you know if there's any skin contact. Uh, it's going to pull off some of the color. So, you know, even though technically this is a white wine, you know, it, it's got more of a rosé color to yeah. it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, wine number two, the Val de Chon is, um, yeah, it's not a heavy extracted, like super pink color. It's more of a light salmon. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. So you can tell that it's a rosé, but it's not a, you know, a neon pink rosé by any means. Yeah, we've had this on the list of odd fish for a couple of months now, and it's being extremely well received. As a wine lover, I love this rosé. I think it's fantastic. I'm going to be drinking it all summer long. Uh, definitely more of a premium rosé. Um, it's just fantastic. Uh, so it's, this winery um, has a, a very, the property has a very long history. Um, the current owners have owned it since 2003. Uh, it's a kind of a reclusive French family and I couldn't find a, a lot of information about it. But what I did find was that previous to 2003, the family they bought it from had owned it for over 400 years. Mm -hmm. Into that family by French royalty, by the king at the time. Yeah. So, big, large historic property, but the, the current owners have had it since 2003. Uh, mm -hmm. But 90 hectares or 225 acres are planted to vines. There's another 30 hectares uh, planted to olives. Um, the entire estate is certified biodynamic, uh, so organic and 
uh, organic and biodynamic viticulture on the property. Um, they're in Aon Provence, which is about 30 kilometers north of Marseille. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, you know, the Mediterranean, that part of France is very hot. It's very dry. Uh, there's lots of wind coming from the ocean and coming down from the, the uh, Rhone. Uh, you know, they get the Mistral there, which is a very powerful wind that comes in from the north. So uh, it's very easy to farm organically. Uh, in that part of France, because you've got wind that's keeping the bugs and the, the you know, the, the mildew pressure away, and it's hot, it doesn't get very rainy, so you don't have a lot of humidity, so you're not worried about rot. Um, so yeah, um, there's a big push from the growers of that region to farm organically, to, um, you know, farm in a more sustainable way, so that's what they're doing. Uh, 120 hectares seems huge. Is that huge for wineries in that area? Uh, I don't I mean, no, I don't think so. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's big tracts of land down there. So yeah, you get, uh, you know, you get big swaths of vineyard land. It's fairly flat, hot and dry mm -hmm. farm, uh, but they make fantastic wines. So uh, this rosé, um, it's quite <sighs> uh, perfumed on the nose. It is mostly Grenache and uh, there's some skin. So 60% so Grenache. 30% Cinso, and then there's a 10% Roll or Vermentino, which is a white grape variety. So you've got a little bit of uh, white uh, grape in here. And what that uh, Vermentino does is it adds uh, a lovely texture. There's like a round, almost oily texture to this wine, and that's coming from the Vermentino. So um, again, beautiful aromatics. You know, usually I would expect to get like more red fruit on this, which I do, but I also get like a lot of melon on this. And then there's you know, there's uh, herbs de Provence, that garrigue, so, so the fresh like rosemary, thyme, lavender that grow in the, the region, and that certainly appears in this. Mm -hmm. Also gravel. The bone dry on the palate, and I get that melon, I get that uh, red berry fruit, I get the lavender. But there's a slight bitterness to this as well. Um, and it kind of reminds me, you know, it's, it's very floral and it's got that bitterness. It kind of reminded, reminds me of dandelion or dandelion leaves that we get in salads sometimes, which I think is quite cool. Um, I mentioned the oily texture. Good amount of freshness. The alcohol's in check. It's very moderate. Good freshness. The, the finish is, you know, fairly long. It really pushes through with a nice fruity kind of mineral aftertaste. Um, yeah, I, I love this rosé. Um, our guests love this rosé. Uh, so yeah, come come into Odd Fish for sure. And it's going to be kicking around all summer. Hey, um, I have a question for amateur rosé buyers like me. Um, you know, you talk about this as Grenache and Cinzo and, uh, and Vermentino. Uh, if I'm looking, you know, perusing the shelves of a, of a nice wine store, there's now there's lots. Like, let's say there's 40 different rosés on there, if not more. Um, and now how much am I paying attention to the great varietals? Because me as an amateur, I think of Grenache and Cinzo, red grapes. So you're going to bring more body to the game. Does that transfer over to the rosé or is it is it all about that blend and the Vermentino takes it somewhere? You know, um, yeah, so just as, as a purchaser of rosé, you know, um, how much am I paying attention to that? And then how much does that correspond to, oh, I want something bright and fresh or I want something a little more, you know, depth to it, you know, that type of a thing. Like, how does that purchasing decision go together other than asking the person in the store to help you? Well, I mean, you should absolutely help the, ask the people in the store to help you. That's what they're there. They're, you know, usually wine, very, very passionate about wine. So they, they love to talk about wine as, as I do. But a couple of good rules of thumb. Um, if you want something that's more fruit driven, I would definitely look more towards this side of the pond. I would look, you know, to BC, California, Oregon, wherever, um, you know, anywhere in the new world, anywhere that didn't have kings and queens in the 1700s. Uh, if you want something more fruit driven, I would stick to the old, uh, to the new world, excuse me. Uh, if you're looking for more mineral and maybe slightly less fruity, maybe a little bit more spicy, savory rosés, then certainly you can look to Europe. Um, 
And another good rule of thumb is uh, if you like a weightier rosé, if you want something with a little bit more richness, a little heavier, then look to warmer regions like the south of France, like southern Italy, um, you know, like Greece. Um, and if you want like lighter, tartar, fresher styles and looks like Northern Europe, you can look to Northern Italy, Northern parts of France, like the Loire Valley uh, makes an excellent, uh, many different excellent rosés from Pinot Noir, from Cabernet Franc. Um, so so yeah. it's a lot of, lot to do with lo uh, longer growing seasons going to get you the more weight. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the grape varieties certainly do help, but I think mm -hmm. climate, uh, you know, rosé is almost always a, you know, a fresh, vibrant wine and just depends on how fresh and vibrant you want it if you want if you like that freshness if you like that acidity you want it to be lighter 11 percent, 12 percent alcohol then yeah let definitely look to the cooler regions and yeah. if you want something with a little bit more weight and heft and texture like this then yeah, yeah you can look to southern france or like regions that have more and more heat longer growing season and yeah. the, the grapes will reflect that because because that's what they plant mm -hmm. and I think we talked about this earlier, but you don't have to pay too much attention to uh, to age or, or um, you know, their age is not going to help a lot of rosés or am I wrong? In very few cases. I've had some very cool examples of aged rosé and there certainly are uh, age-worthy examples uh, being made, but 99.8% of rosé that's being made is, is going to be the most delicious as soon as it's released or within a year of, of when it was bottled. So I mean, unless you want to get super geeky, like I would not age this rosé. Could it age? Could it hold for a couple of years? Sure. But um, it's it's at its best now. I'll drink it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, does it obviously a stupid question since it's coming from me, but, uh, you know, Beaujolais has uh, Beaujolais Nouveau parties and, you know, the big release of that. Um, do many uh, do many places celebrate like the rosé when it gets released and and gets bottled and that type of thing to drink it like straight away in, in certain uh you know wine making communities that's a good question i can't think of any i know that there was a there was a couple of like rosé themed celebrations in bc before covid um not for a particular reason but just celebrating rosé yeah uh, Maybe we'll see some this summer. I'm not sure, but I don't think it was any specific region. It was just like, let's celebrate rosé because it's delicious. And yeah, yeah. But I can't think of a thing. I can't think of a region that just celebrates their rosé production. Although not a bad idea. Who doesn't love rosé, right? Yeah, I think that uh, we need to pull one off at uh, at uh, Oddfish. We'll actually open up. Uh, uh, of course, Etienne won't watch this video, so uh, we'll open up on a Monday. Yeah, uh, for a special. Uh, <laughs> Rosé celebration, and we'll let Etienne know that we'll need some food for that. <laughs> I, love I love it. Actually, you know what? Um, a couple of years ago, Curtis Colt did a rosé and sausage party at O Carolina that Anne and I went to, and it was super fun. So that would actually be like a really cool idea, not necessarily sausage fraud fish, but um, yeah, that's the last uh, kind of rosé celebration I remember going to, and it, it, was, it was good fun. It was awesome. It was the middle of summer. Well, that would have been last summer, Todd, because they opened up like last spring. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. I think it was last summer. It was just kind of like everything was outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that weirdo little patio off to the side in the front, and yeah, exactly. yeah, it was good fun. So there, we've just come up with an idea for the summer. We just need to figure out how to execute it. All right, closing the streets down, which would be another good idea. <laughs> Wine number three, we're going to go to the United States. We're going to go to California. And we're going to do Poppy Pinot Noir from uh, Monterey or from Arroyo Seco to be more specific. Um, I love this Pinot Noir. Um, sorry, we didn't talk about food and wine pairing with the, the rosé. So you can pair rosé with anything. Uh, but what I would do with this rosé is I would do uh, cheese and charcuterie, you know, classic picnic fare. Uh, specifically, mm -hmm. if you're looking for cheeses, I would do Pecorino Toscana and Comte. And then any of the charcuteries that are offered at Oyama would be would be great. So, sorry. Okay, so that because pecorino has that sharpness to it, and that's what you're thinking of. Yeah, I, I think more like salty. Salty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Salty cheeses. I mean, you know, you could do other cheeses as well, but I think those. I also know because I had those in my fridge and I tried them and they work really well. So. Uh, so where were we? So poppy. So poppy is. Uh, a family-run winery that was started in 1997 by the Silva family. 
Uh, they have a focus on Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, their current winemaker has been with them since 2006, so you know, good 15 years. Uh, and he spent a couple of years, three years uh, actually, working at Calera, which is another winery in that part of California. Calera is uh, Josh Jansen's winery. He makes world-class Pinot Noir. Um, and so getting to a lot of Psalms from California, when they want to learn how to make wine, they go work for Josh Jensen at Calera. So really good pedigree. The wines are fantastic. And so uh, Cornelio Dane is the name of the winemaker at Poppy. And he spent three years working under Josh Jensen before working uh, with, with Poppy. So, you know, he's got some serious street cred. Um, you know, Anna, my wife doesn't usually taste the wines with me uh when i'm when i'm preparing for these but last night she saw that i had the wines open and tasted them and she really loved this uh, pinot noir we drink a lot of pinot in this household so she's been exposed to a lot of different uh bottlings and she thought this was great so um this region is in monterey county so it's located south of san francisco um it's near the salinas valley which is the lettuce capital of the world when you're eating uh lettuce in the in the 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 fall winter months uh, in BC, it's a good possibility that the lettuce has come from the Salinas Valley. Um, there's a mountain range there that uh, that has a valley that runs east to west. So at the end of the valley, all the hot air pools, and then that sucks in all the cool air from the ocean. So it really cools down that valley. So that's why they're able to grow uh, beautiful Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in that area it's also got one of the longest growing seasons in california so the grapes there's not a lot of um risk of you know cold weather or wet weather or disease pressure you know in in september october november so wineries can let the grapes essentially turn into raisins on the on the vine if they want to that's not what poppy does they do a very light fresh style this wine is only about 13 percent alcohol so it's it's quite vibrant and fresh but there are some other wineries that get full ripeness and so you get these like 14 and a half 15 percent uh, alcohol chard chardonnay and pinot noirs that uh could have like stewed and raisin flavors because they just really let the fruit hang but yeah uh, poppy makes a different style it's a, a lighter more vibrant style when uh, is the uh, when does the red flag go up in terms of temperature drop? Like, what what do you have to hit? And then they're like, "Oh God, we we might be in trouble here." I think uh, it becomes more risk of precipitation in that area. I don't think it's it's going to snow, but um, you could get a lot of rain, and then you start to get like disease pressure and, and yeah. uh, fungal pressure. So yeah, I think uh, like November is like when you need to start picking. Also. At that point, the, the grapes or the vines want to shut down. So you need yeah. to get them off so that they can go dormant and have a, a rest cycle so they get ready for the next vintage. And up here, it's much earlier. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's crazy if you look at um, the Okanagan versus like the Napa Valley, because in the summer, it's actually hotter in the south part of the Okanagan Valley than it is in Napa Valley yeah. uh, because it's a desert, right? The southern part of the Okanagan Valley is the northern tip of the Sonoran Desert. So it's hot. It's like 40, 45 degrees some days, right? It doesn't get that hot in Napa. But the difference is, is um, we have a much shorter growing season because by October, November, it's going to be snowing. Yeah. Right? They get the fruit off. Yeah. Right? In, in Napa Valley, it's, they don't have that pressure. Mm -hmm. right? So you need growing areas for sure. Um, this, this wine is incredibly aromatic. I get uh, lots of red berries and red flowers, but they're not super tart and fresh. They're almost dried out a little bit. There's like a, a savory tone to them. And then there's lots of, of baking spices, vanilla, cinnamon, clove. Wine is bone dry. Very moderate, even moderate minus alcohol very soft supple tannins you know it's not the most complex wine but it is delicious and it's got a very like kind of savory spicy finish that just keeps going on and on so i think this wine's really cool i think it's great quality for what it is i mean it's not trying to be something that you're going to put in your cellar 
for the next 15 years. You know, I probably want to drink this within the next couple. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very cool Pinot Noir. Um, I had a, a Pinot Noir on the weekend where we did uh, kebabs. So we did uh, pork that had been cut up into cubes and then had been marinated with um, a grated onion and some olive oil. Then we used uh, garlic, paprika, cumin, cinnamon, salt, and uh, espalette pepper. And that was the marinade. Um, and then put them on skewers with uh, onions, peppers, and mushrooms. And that is exactly what I want uh, with this particular wine. The, the pairing was fantastic. One of the best I've had all year. And I think uh, that type of food, those kind of, you know, sweet baking spices are going to play really well with the sweet baking spices that are in here. And the more savory elements are going to play with like the kind of savory, earthy, kind of dried leaf character that's in this wine. So if you're looking for food ideas, there you go. I love it. We have our chicken noodle soup. We have our pecorino and comte. We have our shish kebab. Mm. This is the start of a very good night. Um, so all, all three of these wines are delicious. Don't think they need to be decanted. You can decant them if you want, um, but I don't think they need to. But wine number four definitely needs to be decanted. Not because I found any sediment, or at least there wasn't any sediment in my bottle, but this is a world-class uh, Melbeck, one of the best. And it is, um, yeah, I mean, this is a wine that could certainly sell her for the next 20 years and gain some, some, some like nuance with the aging process. Uh, it's drinking just fine now, but it, uh, it is going to benefit from being in a decanter for an hour before you open it or give it a, a good shake in the bottle after you've opened it to, to get some air in there. Um, I don't usually talk about color in my tasting notes and I don't know how well it's translating on this video, but this wine is opaque purple. It is like, actually, I'm gonna read a, a tasting note because when I prepare for these uh, videos, I always do a little prep on the, the winery. And I found a tasting note from uh, Venice, which is where I, where I subscribe to, to get my, my vintage reports and my scores and all that good stuff. And so this is the tasting note that I'm going to read from their website. So Atentico is a wine inspired by old reds from the region when there wasn't any oak to tone down the intensity of the Melbeck. <clears throat> this Melbeck comes from the Colme Vineyard set at 2,300 meters above sea level. It's as dark as a moonless night in the valley with a nose of spice, blackberry, blackberry syrup, and country herbs, elemental, concentrated, and intense, presenting a firm structure and active tannins. A bed is provided by the significant but well-integrated amount of alcohol while the finish is sweet. Mountaintop sunshine in a bottle. That was their tasting note. And I don't think they're wrong because my tasting note was very similar before I read it. Um, what can I tell you, you about the quantity? You included the you included the dark night and the mountaintop sunshine in your tasting note? I did not. I certainly did not. <laughs> but I did comment on the opaque purple color. Um, <laughs> that is so freaking obvious. As soon as you start like, like I said, uh, before we uh, started recording, I'm like, wow, this one, this one is impossible to confuse with the other. This is yeah, this it, is another world. It literally looks like motor oil. <laughs> it's so yeah. rich. Um, but that being said, <clears throat> I love the style of Melbeck. I'm not a huge fan of Melbeck per se, but I do like this wine and respect it a lot. Uh, so this winery, Colme, uh, was founded in 1831. So nearly 200 year old winery. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the current owner is Donald Hess from uh, the Hess Wine Collection in California. Uh, but uh, this this wine is made in a super old school style. Like you mentioned in the, the tasting note, there's no new oak on this wine, which is kind of an anomaly because with Melbeck, you almost always see new oak uh, because it can handle it. It's, it's a rich grape variety. It's got lots of color, flavor, alcohol, tannin, um, and the oak helps soften that tannin and adds a layer of complexity to an already complex wine. Um, but, you know, back when they first started making Melbeck, I mean, they didn't have oak to age the wines in. So they've kind of gone back to their roots. So this, this uh, is from their best vineyard. Uh, like they mentioned, 2,300 meters above sea level. So it's, you know, well over 5,000 feet above sea level. It's a really, really high elevation. Um, 
it's their ungrafted vines. And what that means is, is almost every grapevine in the world is planted on American rootstock um, because of a tiny little pest called phylloxera that originated in North America. And in the, the 1800s, uh, there was some plant material that got transferred to uh, Europe uh, and it transported these little, little microscopic bugs that eat the roots um, and it decimated the vineyards of Europe. Um, and so the solution to that is to, because American uh, grapevines are resistant to phylloxera, virtually every vineyard in the world is now planted on American rootstock. There's very few um, vineyards that are planted on their, their own rootstock because the little pests get in there, eat them, and then the vineyards die. But mm -hmm. uh, because this is an old vineyard at high elevation, probably in sandy soil where phylloxera can't thrive, uh, it's planted on its own uh, rootstock. So that makes it quite unique. Um, so yeah, this is aged uh, in stainless steel and in concrete tanks. Um, and so you get this, this real denseness, uh, but without any oak influence, which I think is quite cool. Um, being planted at that kind of elevation, you get really intense sunshine. Uh, and for that reason, you get smaller berries and thicker skins on the berries. So you have less juice to skin ratio and the skins are thicker. There's more of them. So you get deeply colored, deeply tannic red wines uh, when you have those growing conditions. And I think that's pretty evident uh, in, in this wine. Um, so I'll give my tasting note. So I put uh, bone dry. Opaque purple in color, ripe blue and black fruits, lilacs, lead pencil, pen ink, smoked meat, mesquite, black pepper, really complex wine, really dense, it's full bodied, creamy texture with moderate acidity, you know, moderate plus to high, like woolly tannins. Uh, the alcohol is high, but very well integrated. It says 14 and a half on the, the label. with a long fruity finish is what I put. And I also noted that this wine needs to be decanted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I opened this wine last night to do my tasting notes, uh, put the wines into my, my wine fridge and then pulled them back out this morning. And this wine is a lot more expressive this morning than it was last night when I opened it. So yeah, definitely give this an hour in the decanter or give yeah. it uh, the shake yeah. Before, yeah. Before, you, before you drink it. What if you don't have a decanter at home? Uh, if you don't have a decanter, use a mason jar. Yeah, you can right? use anything. A anything, anything. Yeah. Like, a, you know, a, 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 like I've used a vase, you know, I've used yeah. a measuring cup. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You just air into it. It doesn't have to be fancy, honestly. You know, t take it, pour it into a, like a one liter mason jar and then grab a funnel, pour it back into the bottle. There, it's decanted. Yeah, right? or leave it in the mason jar and pour it out of there. Yeah, it, it'll be a lot easier to pour of the bottle than it will out of the mason jar. Yeah, yeah right? you'll de definitely get a bigger glass coming out of the mason jar for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't have to be a fancy decanter. And if you want a fancy decanter, go buy one at Winners. That's where I buy mine. Right? Yeah, the there's nothing one. complicated about it. Exactly. You don't have to spend a lot of money. If you want yeah. to, by all means. But um, for for our viewers who are, are fans of the um, the H, I think it's HBO series uh, Succession. I'm not sure if you've seen that, Todd. I've never seen it. Okay, so uh, in its second season, I remember, I think it might have been, it's probably Kendall, uh, one of the main protagonists in it. Um, he is decanting his wine with a blender and it's called hyperoxygenation. And it wasn't the first time I like, I saw that and it seemed like for the next two weeks, I think it's because people are such fans of the show, it was a little bit in the news that that's the new way to decant wine, to get as much air and to break it up as possible. Um, is there any logic to that? Or are you just rolling your eyes going, no, this, this is the worst idea ever? There is some logic to it, but I would argue if you're gonna take a fine expensive wine, I mean, you know, if you take a sauce and you gently simmer it for hours as opposed to boil it for 15 minutes, you're going to get a different result. And I would argue that is the same thing, uh, the same 
you know, it's a good analogy because if you take a wine and you gently decant it into a, a decanter uh, and let it sit for an hour and let, you know, the oxygen do its work as opposed to putting it into a blender and for 30 seconds, you're going to get a different result. Okay. Uh, and the wine that he was opening on succession was probably very expensive. I would never take any of my fine, expensive wines and put it into a blender. That's just me. Right. And it kind of made me think of this because I'm like, this is a chunky mouthful. So I'm like, should this be, should this be in my, in my uh, RoboCoop? You know? you know, there is actually a, a device that was designed for wine called the V-Spin, which I have. And it's got, it's a regular decanter, but on the base of the decanter, there's a magnet inside. And then inside the decanter, there is a, another magnet that's covered in a, you know, a, a, a plastic a polyurethane and you put it on the base, you hit a button and then the magnet spins. Okay. Right? And it will help open the wine up a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I've done several experiments with it. Um, I find it works better on like bigger, richer wines. So I think with this Colomay, I think it would actually help the wine with a lighter, delicate Pinot Noir. I don't, you know, right. I, I've never, I've never seen it uh, benefit a wine like that, but a, a rich muscular wine like this one. Yeah, absolutely. Like two minutes in the V spin is definitely going to help open it up a little faster. Yeah. And it's just like that. Uh, I wish I had the device since I'm going to refer to it. May, many people are not, might not be able to picture it, but it's that silver device with the uh, the strainer in it that usually to catch sediment. So you put that on the top of your decanter and mm -hmm. then it has these spouts. So it actually goes down like six sides of the bottle. And that that's probably a pretty smart way to, to get more air. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great. Like, um, you know, at, at former restaurants where, you know, I was solely focused on wine service and somebody doesn't order, you know, their 1990 Bordeaux until just before the meal hits, you've got to get that wine open and get the sediment out and make sure that the first sip is perfect because they're about to have dinner. So yeah, those, those things really come in handy. You're not being violent with the wine, but you are helping introduce oxygen in a, like a gentler way. Yeah. Uh, the wine's going to show its best after a few minutes rather than like an hour. Yeah. Yeah, because when I decant wines, I do take the decanter and give it a good little swirl. Though. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's an older wine, um, then generally not. I'm usually pretty gentle with it. But with a young wine like this Colomay, yeah, you can you can give it a little air. It's not it's not going to hurt it. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll talk quickly about the the food pairing on this. So I yeah, mean, yeah, I would you know steak you know, meat is the obvious answer, but I, I honestly think that any kind of uh, red meat or game meat that's been braised really low and slow um, is going to be a really good match with this. So like brisket or, you know, smoked ribs or something like that, something meaty with a lot of flavor because this wine's yeah. got a ton of flavor and can stand up to it. Yeah. Um, you can drink it on its own too, but I think uh, like a, a little nosh is going to make it uh, much better. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a mouthful. It's uh, it's a bit much for me, that's for sure. You know, it's uh, it's definitely just a, a, a small. I don't know. I'm a, I'm more of a Pinot fan, to be honest with you. But uh, you know, it's not like I'm that discerning, and uh, I'm sure anything will work for 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 my uncomplicated palate. Um, but uh, well, this has been great. So there we go. We knocked out the four, um, and um, yeah, I. I think, I think Jamie was talking about doing a pork and mushroom ragu. So that that's would definitely fall in line to with this one, I believe. For sure. Yeah. Something that's been cooked low and slow, lots of, lots of flavor, lots of richness. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I hate you. Um, you sent me this month, you sent me the most uh, music picks you've ever sent me. And uh, I've made my way through them and, and most of them made the, uh, the cut for sure. And uh, um, any, do you remember any of the, the ones that any of the gems you sent me or any, I, I put you on the spot here? It's hard no, to remember. No, uh, you know, we last month, we didn't really talk about the playlist too much before we did the recording. And so we decided, well, we should have at least uh, a little bit to talk about. So when we were talking yeah. about it this month, um, we both just said, hey, let's just make a playlist that we both want to listen to. And, you know, the, you know, it's been kind of rainy the last couple of days, but 
we, we had a lot of really nice uh, days in the last month where I have an arrangement with my dog. If it's not raining, he's getting an hour long walk. And so I put my headphones in and, you know, we go for a walk for 60 or 90 minutes. And, you know, I just wanted to, I just, all, all I put onto that playlist was uh, music that I was listening to while I was walking my dog, stuff that was upbeat and cheery for like spring walks. Yeah. So, um, and once again, we ran the gamut, like there's, uh, there's, there's, let's put it mild hip hop, but uh, you know, uh, and uh, there's like a lot of soul as we always do. Uh, there's some there's some 70s and 80s stuff on there. There's one that uh, I just put on this morning of yours. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe you. I, I I can't I shouldn't say I can't believe you found this. I'm just like I can't believe I haven't heard this in like 15, 20 years, and can't remember the exact one. But um, but yeah, I think it's a little all over the place. But as you said, I just wanted to make something that I just wanted to listen to. You know, didn't have to follow any theme. It's just uh, and once again, it's all over the place. You know, there's ups and downs, and and to me, that's um. That to me is a good, like if you're having friends over, having dinner and having wine, um, I think you want that because sometimes you want to almost sing along and other times you want something that falls into the background but keeps the thing going. And I, I don't know, I like that peaks and valleys because it's not, you know, you aren't raging all the time. And sometimes you do want to get distracted by the song or you want it to come come up and uh, <clears throat> uh, take center stage. You're like, oh my God, remember the song? Or, oh, I love this song, that type of a thing. So that's just kind of how I think with with especially people being over restaurants a bit different. I kind of want to keep it moving all the time with the playlist, you know, not too many flat spots, but a dinner party or people coming over, you don't mind it to go down a little bit and come back up, I think. Absolutely. And I actually listened to our playlist. I had uh, people over on Friday and Saturday this week and I used our playlist, you know, after, you know, the two hours or three hours and Spotify kicks in and creates a playlist based off the playlist we were just listening to. And it's yeah, super fun. So yeah. And there's a, there's a bit of local representation. Um, one band that uh, you put it on and I, I put on, I think we put the same song yeah, on because, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's XL the band. And uh, you know, uh, what a strange pairing. And, and um, I don't know, sometimes our wines are strange pairings too, or interesting. Like I wouldn't have guessed you would have put a Greek wine on. You know, I did not see that coming. Um, and uh, much like I didn't see the combination of XL the band who was like, the, the me swollen members who are pretty hard, um, they go hard and you know, they're hip hop and, uh, and I've seen them live and I love them, but they're more, of, they fall in my workout mixes, you know, where I want to be like pretty jacked. And, uh, but they teamed up with our friend, Lisa Norman, who's I've known for probably 20 years throughout the restaurants, um, family, um, she's a flautist, classically trained voice and they're a band and they just finished their European tour yesterday. They're flying back right now. Never in a million years would I have thought that they would have found each other. I have no idea how they crossed paths and now they have a band together and it really is like Prev and uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's spitting out the rhymes and then it goes to, to her beautiful voice and then the flute is in there and it's, I love it. I, I absolutely love this song, Loose Time, and uh, mm -hmm. I can't get enough of it. And their whole album is uh, is pretty cool. So I don't know. It, it's always fun to have like a 100% local collection or, or connection on this because, you know, Prev's a, a fixture in Kitsilano. Um, who's the other guy? Mad Child. I don't know his real name, but, uh, you know, he lives in the island now. It's uh, I don't know. It's pretty rad. So I like finding these little gems and I think you've had a few on there that there's a, there's a local connection there too, I think, but I don't know. I was just kind of going through a bunch of stuff and I don't know. I really like this one because it, it truly is <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. I, I can't wait to listen to it at my next dinner party. <laughs> right on. Okay. Well, I think that's uh, we've taken up enough of uh, everyone's time uh, just talking stuff and hopefully you got something out of this and enjoy the wines and, and, um, Wish we could talk more about the food, but uh, the kitchen has, uh, is keeping a bit of a surprise to us. I have an inkling that's what's going to happen, but uh, we'll see what you get. And I uh, hope you enjoy, and we'll see you next month. Peace.